People say, oh, how can we do this? Here's what we need to do. Here's where we are. How do we get from here to there? Some of you may have heard of Lincoln Lake. Uh, they make arc welders. And um, the, the owner, uh, I think it was a summer owner actually, decided on a, uh, a performance pay system where um, you, you didn't have a salary, you were paid on the basis of your, your, work, your work, what you did. And uh, they gave a bonus at the end of the year that oftentimes was equal to the salary, of, you know, to what they made. I mean, it was well known if you go to the web and, and uh, search on Lincoln Electric, you will see some of this. And um, they had done really well for many, many years. They're, they're over 100 years old now. And uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, I'm at the age where I can't, the time flies, so I don't know dates too well. But it was a while ago, 10 15 years ago. We had a recession. And of course, there were fewer demands for arc welders. So what they do? They went to people and said, hey, we're not selling enough to support what we're doing, so what do we do? And so they came with an idea that, that, that well, there are a lot of places we never, we never get to call on because they're not big enough. We don't have the sales force they call everybody that uses arc welders. So, so why don't we send all of our technical people out to the field, you know, find uh, little shops and so on that we might sell to. And they avoided the recession. They had no layoff because the sales actually maintained during that year. But when you talk about that it, it's a resource, it is a resource. And we, we know that when we have when we ask when we ask a lot of people to help us, that usually somebody's gonna help you, right? I was telling a group yesterday also about uh, there's something, some of you people in medicine, med the medical field, healthcare, um, there's something about uh, medical tech, the medical uh, uh, science. It's called folding proteins. I don't know exactly what it is, but I've heard about it a lot. Some of uh, being able to fold proteins. Now, you know, we're talking about microscopic, microscopic stuff. And, and they couldn't figure out how to do this with a problem. So what they did on the web, they said, hey, we're having, we're having trouble figuring out how to do this. And anybody that has an idea, let us know. Well, a woman in England solved the problem. Guess what her job was? She's a secretary. I mean, she advanced medical science dramatically. Well, how did she do that? Well, she loved working puzzles. You know, she did it in her spare time. And so over the weekend, she took this problem and, and she solved it. And I said, it really is a resource that is, is not used very much. I was, uh, we did a lot of work with Kodak, and their demise was not our fault. You know? <laughs> but, but uh, uh, they were a good client early on, and uh, um, there's a guy there who was, he was an Englishman actually, because I loved his accent, and uh, he had, he was a, uh, a line employee, he was an hourly employee, but he was uh, a step above the front line because he would step in for the supervisor sometime when the supervisor wasn't there. <laughs> And uh, he, when we uh, started working with him, his manager told me, he said, I gave him your book. Now, it's, 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 we call it the R plus book, but it's a, it's, a, it's a long book. You know, it's used by universities more uh, now than any other business. And so it's like 300 pages. And uh, he read the book. He says he carried that book around like the Bible. You know, he's walking around and somebody asks him a question. He said, well, it's right here. And he, he would show him. And he had used this with his team until the point that the team performed in ways that called attention to other places. And other people at this same level started asking him if he would come and help their team. 
Now, this was in no way what he was paid to do. Well, it, it, it spread so much that they heard about it at the level of the president. Now, Kodak Park at that time had 22,000 employees. And John was asked to have dinner and lunch in the, with the president and his staff. <coughs> Tell about how he'd done this. And so I uh, spoke to him afterwards, and I said, John, how was it? He said, they eat good. <laughs> well, I'm sure they do, but I mean, what, what, they, what they ask you? He said, well, the president actually said, that, well, John, what do you have to tell us? He said, you shouldn't ask me that. I said, why? He said, well, what I told him was about my first day at Kodak. He said, you know, nobody, no young person ever rides by this plant and says, someday I want to be an operator at Kodak. He says, no young person has that ambition. He said, do you know why? He said, well, first day I came to Kodak Park, he said, I'm on the job about an hour. I have no idea. I called my supervisor over and said, hey, have y'all ever thought, he said, before I finish my sentence, he said, John, how did you get to work today? He said, what do you mean? He said, how did you get to Kodak Park? He said, in my car. He said, well, how about tomorrow? Leave your brain in your car. He said, I can't. He said, why not? He said, I drive a compact. <laughs> now, Corey, I told that story to another one of our customers. Can, can you tell us also about the science a little bit more? How you do, how you create these great results? Well, you're a troublemaker. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I told a story to uh, another one of our customers, and uh, a guy came to me after and he said, he said, that exact thing happened to me. He said, I was working with a telephone company. He said, on my first day, we were just, we, I was out installing a telephone call. He said, and I had an idea. And he said, when I saw the supervisor come up, he wasn't with him, you know, he came up to the job site. And he, he said, I went out to meet him. That's the first day. He said, hey. I thought about, said he stopped me. He said, you're not paid to think, get the damn pole on the ground. But here's the thing, he said, I never did again. So I realized at that moment, you ain't gonna like this. I went back to school. And you see the, 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 about the science. There's a thing in science that if, Innovation, new ideas, have a short history of reinforcement. And they're, they're extinguished very quickly. So if somebody has an idea and it's punished, guess what? They may have another idea, but you'll never know about it, right? But they'll go home in their garage, in their basement, or with their friend, they're going to work on it. They'll think there's something here. Now, if you look at uh, this, let me just uh, make one other point about the science. There are a lot of people that write books, and I'm one of them, so I, I can't be too critical of that, except that uh, many people write books on their personal experience. And Benjamin Franklin said it well. He says, experience is dear teacher, but fools will learn in no other. Experience is dear school, and fools will learn in no other. You know, you can have good, good and bad experiences. We all, you know, have some of both. But the fact of the matter is that when we talk about the science, we're talking about something that has not two or three studies. And we are talking earlier today about the idea that replication of studies is not, universities don't do this very often. You know, because they want you to do something new and novel, and they want you to do something somebody else already done, right? And so we accept bad data. We accept bad results. And we want to say, well, so-and-so found, and I read a study just recently about med medical uh, results, medical studies, 
that something like 35% of them cannot be replicated. Imagine if that to concern you if you have a health problem to go to the hospital. And somebody has done something to uh, create fraudulent data because we can't repeat that. Now what I've got up here is, you know, when you're asked about really important what's the research, I can point you to 50,000 studies. No, actually, myself, but I mean, I can, we can find, somebody can find 50,000 studies. I mean, I belong to an association that every year they do about 2,000 2, studies at this conference. And guess what they're all on? Well, they're all on this. And behavior is the center piece, and A stands for antecedents, and C stands for consequences. And this, is the, this year will be the 41st year we've been doing this. And every year we've had between one and 2,000 studies. So, and they're all about the same kind of thing. It's about, we, we, we know that reinforcement work, we know the consequences work. And so it's so changed about, can we make it more efficient, more effective, and talk? This, this is, to behavior analysis, what this is to physics. You see, a lot of people say, well, that's, you mean you can explain all behavior with A, B, and C? Absolutely. All behavior. Routine behavior, creative behavior, innovative behavior, funny behavior, uh, you know, whatever it is we want, is A, B, or C. Now, we don't know everything there is to know, because we, this year we're going to have a conference, I forget where it is, but there will be 2,000 more studies, at least. But we're learning more and more about it. Now, we know more about the effect of reinforcement today than we did you know, 40 years ago. But each study fills out the picture a little more, as you would in chemistry or physics. Right? Now, if you understand that antecedents or anything that comes before that tells you what to do, right? as a stop sign will tell you, in uh, Amsterdam, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> a red light, what does the word red light mean? Hurry? Uh, but a stop sign is an antecedent for either the hitting the accelerator or the brake to stop. Now many people don't stop because the consequences they've experienced don't match the behaviors desire, right? So there, there's, a, there's a, a, a consequence that's assumed that if you don't stop, Something bad will happen to you. But guess what? Most of the time, it doesn't. You just get where you're going faster than if you'd stop for life. So, people don't stop. Now, you might say, well, you do. I do. Why doesn't everybody else stop? Well, everybody, remember, everybody's different from you. They've had different experiences with something as simple as stopping for a stop sign. See, you may have lived, you may have grown up in the country where uh, you can see all directions and there's no traffic and there's a stop sign there, but what do you do? You ignore it because you can, I can see there's not, nobody coming. So there's nothing going to happen to me. And so you come to the city and guess what? Even though you see things, you, do, well, you ignore that part of the environment and you're wrong. Now, so. The closest thing we have, however, in other words, antecedents are variable in terms of producing behavior. Right. That sometimes we obey them, sometimes we don't, but it's always in terms of favoring you. Because you always have, like, you have an excuse for why I didn't stop, right? Well, I was in a hurry. That's like the guy that would have stopped. I, this is a quote from somebody, a patrolman stopped and says, why were you going so fast? He said, well, I was afraid I'd run out of gas. <laughs> so I had to, you know, really go fast to get to the gas station. Well, we can always justify our behavior, but the fact of the matter is that we all respond to consequences in a way that's unique to us, that matches, matches our history. 
our experience uh, in the world. Uh, so here's some things uh, in summary fashion, very quickly. Now, there are basically four behavioral consequences. Now, we didn't invent these. These have been discovered, you know, in science. And people say, well, that, will, will it work in Holland? Well, or do we have people in Holland? I think it will work in Holland. Yeah, I do. Wait, do you have, is your heart on the left or right side? Because you're, you're, you're Dutch, Dutch Landers or whatever you call yourself. No, you don't call yourself Dutch Lander. That's German, isn't it? But anyway, you, know, you don't have your heart on the opposite side that I do. In other words, I'd be, I'd be afraid to go to the doctor here because he might not know where my heart is. Because I'm an American. <laughs> I'm a person first, right? So, you know, I go to the doctor here as comfortable as I would in the United States because I know you're going to find my organs in the same place. And the same thing with behavior. You respond to gravity, you respond to reinforcement, you respond to the effects of your environment. Just like we do everywhere else. So if we look at, there are two ways, here's, here's a summary of some things that are important. There are two ways that we get people to do something more often. One's with positive reinforcement, the other's with negative reinforcement. Now the difference between the two is that Positive reinforcement is the only consequence that maximizes performance. Now, the problem you see in organization is that when you're in trouble, you get more negative. Have you ever noticed that? If we don't improve, if we don't improve productivity, somebody's going to lose their job. You know, and. and but, but it should be a time, you see, if you understand reinforcement, that positive reinforcement accelerates the rate of responding. It accelerates the rate of responding. So what it does, if we're in trouble, what do we do? We need to be using positive reinforcement more frequently to cause that uptick in behavior. But we typically do things that cause behavior to go down when the time we need the most. I mean, that's how uh, rational we are, or irrational. You want to stop behavior, then we have punishment and penalty. And punishment is where you get something you don't want. Uh, penalty is where you lose something you have. As a fine, you know, you, you, you speed and occasionally somebody gets caught and they have to pay a fine. You know, you got money that they take from you because you did something you weren't supposed to do. And those two things stop behavior. So if you think about applying this in the workplace, if we want people to do something more often, then what we've got to do is to find a way that they experience, that they experience positive consequences for what they do. Now, I don't have it up here, but ignoring behavior would cause what, do you think? Would it cause people to do something more often or less often? It's called extinction. And so if, if you've reinforced the behavior to get it up and you stop, eventually the behavior will go down. It undergoes, the technical term would be, it undergoes extinction. Right? Well, you lose huh? You lose attention. Yeah, yeah, well, you, you, you just, the behavior that was reinforced does not, no longer produces reinforcement, so you, you just quit. After time, I mean, it's like you, you try a vending machine or something and you put your money in and it falls back out. You put it in and it falls back out. And after a while you say, ah, it doesn't work. We see this kind of thing at work all the time. See, if, if I'm doing something at work and it doesn't produce any change in the environment, then eventually I stop. Now, the good news you see from magic is that this is all rational. And so much of what is written in the literature is very hard to implement. Say, so, well, you need to be more humble and tell a leader. You, you, humility is something you need to develop. Well, the question you should have is, what behavior are you talking about? What am I supposed to do? I learned lots of lessons early on uh, because I didn't have business training and that probably might have been a plus, I don't know. But 
I was in a, a textile mill, and they were having real turnover problems. They couldn't keep people on the job because they were paying <coughs> bad wages, the environment was noisy, and you know, a lot of negatives. And uh, so I'm talking to Howard, the plant manager. And he's telling me all these problems, you know, these, uh, and I said, uh, doing my psychology self, you know, I said, uh, well, Howard, uh, what do you think you ought to do? He looked at me and he said, hell, if I knew what to do, I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> I learned, you know, I got to be able to tell him, but Howard, do this more often. Don't do that. Do this. And we're going to track that and we'll see is that occurring more or less often. So we'll know that do this more or do this less. I thought it's doing this. Now, uh, I could talk to you a long time about this. But the thing about it is, if you think about the first diagnostic is, do I want more or less or less of it? If I want more of it, then I only have two choices. I can do positive and negative reinforcement. Or less of it, I can do punishment and penalty. Now the question for you, of course, is well, which one should I do? Well, here's the deal, and this is something a lot of people don't understand or believe. And that is that positive reinforcement gets more behavior than negative. Even though negative reinforcement increases behavior, positive reinforcement is going to get more. And we call that a want-to curve. That I do this because I want to, not because I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't. No, negative reinforcement is where you, you increase your behavior, you increase effort in order to escape or avoid some negative consequence. It might not surprise you, or maybe it does. Goal setting is typically a negative reinforcement procedure. Most people get get to goal, the consequence of getting to goal is you avoid the displays of the manual. So they think we've got something that our problem is goal setting. No, it's not goal setting. It's about the way you treat people. Now, in case my time runs out, which it probably is, let me just say, make sure you understand this. The worst advice you could ever give or get is always be positive. Positive reinforcement increases the behavior that precedes it. So if somebody's done something wrong, that's not the time to positive reinforce it. Now my friends, my golfing buddies particularly, when we go on a trip, you know, eating at a restaurant, and they'll see a child misbehaving at a nearby table. And it's like all heads turn to me. <laughs> and the question I have is, well, how are you gonna how are you gonna positively reinforce that? <laughs> because they, they think I'm like I'm a positive, I spend positive stuff, you know, that, that I think all problems can be solved with positive. No, no, I can't. Because the time we need the time we positive, but it's important how different, right? Now, as a parent, you know, I have two girls, and, and I guess people who know me know that they're aware, right? They got me wrapped right around the finger. They didn't get anything they want from me. And I can remember as a child, uh, I remember them as a child, when they would do something wrong, I mean, I wanted their attention. I wanted, I wanted them to know what I love them and so on. And so I would find myself telling them, while they're crying, they love them. Because I, I punch them in some way, you know, I deprive them of something or whatever. And I wanted to know this was not the end of the world and that daddy still loves you. And well, I learned later, you know, like people say to me, I wish I'd known this 20 years ago. I said, I've said the same thing. That is not the time to have that conversation. They've done something to displease me, so go cry, get it over with. But when you come out and change the way you behave toward your sister, then we're going to talk about how daddy loves you, right? Because you see, when they're upset and I tell them daddy loves you, you know what, what they think? You don't. You don't care a thing about me. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you want to go see some of the things, right? So what happens is 
that reinforcement is most effective that is immediate. All consequences are most effective when they're immediate. And this is why, you know, you've heard catch, uh, phrases like, catch somebody doing something, doing something right and so on. And it's true. You know, the best time to, to use consequences of any kind, positive or negative, is when the people are engaged in the behavior. Any time later, you see, what can happen is if somebody does something at point A and you recognize it at point B and there's a time gap, other behaviors can come into play, right? But we don't stop behaving during the interval. We do things, and it could be, it could be, many times it happens, that the behavior that intervenes is bad. And by the time we get around recognizing it, you know, it's the wrong behavior. Now this is why it's important, you see, for supervisors, and, and in some organizations that are training peers, we train everybody in the company sometimes, that they are in a, the employees are in the best position to catch other people doing the job. Right? So when they see somebody doing something that's helpful, particularly where the person had been helpful before, it's important that behavior be, becomes recognized because that's a novel behavior of that person and it has a short uh, life if it's not supported in some way by consequences. So peers are a good source of uh, effect that's efficient reinforcement. Now, if, if you understand, you read terms like offer conditioning, uh, respondent conditioning, these sorts of terms, and they confuse people, but let me just make it easy to understand. Offer conditioning, BF Skinner used that, and, and basically what he meant was that any behavior that operates on your environment, in other words, by operating, it changes the environment, in a way that's favorable to you, is repeated. And one thing I used to do in the classes I would do, I'd say, I want you to write down the number of positive reinforcement. This is like first thing, 8 o'clock in the morning. I want you to write down a list of all the positive reinforcement you got since you got up. I'm like, what? I haven't, I haven't even been around anybody. Well, you didn't turn the water on? You see, the behavior of turning the faucet operates on the environment to produce something that's valuable to me in the moment, right? So what is the, what is the reinforcer in this case? The water comes out. I turn the handle on the door and push, and what I get? I get positive reinforcement. I get a, me, a positive meaning of certain consequence. And so the next time I want to go out the door, I know exactly what to do. And so our environment is filled with consequences that change our behavior day to day. And the more you know about those, what they are and what people experience, then the more position you're in to cause people to do the kinds of things that the organization values. Um, see, uh, uh, let me just put this quickly. Here's something that um, uh, becomes important. Because people want, it's easy to tell people what to do, right? We get everybody together and huddle and say, okay, here's what we're going to do today. Any question? Okay, go do it. Well, sometimes they will do it. And many times they will do it because, in fact, they know that it's valued by the supervisor and the supervisor lets them know. The other time, you know, I was in a plant years ago and, uh, I was visiting a supervisor, this is when I was doing more of the on the ground work. I was visiting a supervisor, talked to him about some quality problem or what. And as I was talking to him, uh, this employee came out, uh, his, his, his boss. And even though I was there, even though I was there, he starts shooting him out. I mean, he was, his language was vulgar, his voice was loud, his behavior was offensive, you know, really. And it was embarrassing to me, and, and you know, you kind of just stand and look down at your shoes, you know, while you hear this. And I mean, I, I mean, it was, it was, I had not been working in plants very long, and, you know, I didn't quite know what to say. And so when he walked away, 
I said, man, I said, he got off to a bad start today, didn't he? You know what he said to me? Don't pay him no mind. That's the way he is. Because what he told him was, he said, if this happens again, I'm going to fire you. He said, he says it all the time. He says, if I've been fired every time he told me I'd been fired, I wouldn't work here a week. So he threatened to fire me every week. Well, nobody paid any attention. And this is why we ignore a lot of our environment, because it doesn't produce any consequences for us in the beginning. And so we don't have all these rules, you know, about what people are supposed to do, but if there's never any consequences, you know, we ignore it. What well, doesn't mean anything. You see, it's like, uh, my wife would like me to tell you this, but, but she's, uh, she's complains to me, well, you never listen to me. And she's right. She talks all the time. <laughs> I mean, how can I listen to her? I mean, after a while, you know, What'd you say? <laughs> I mean, that if we have rules and we don't follow them, then we forget the rule. I worked with the nuclear power industry a lot in the United States, and they never saw a process that they didn't like. And they keep adding processes, they never eliminate one. They're not one that replaces another, it's always there. And they've got, they got a stack of processes, I'm not exaggerating when I say from the floor here. Nobody can know them all. You can't know them all. And so they, they tend to ignore them. And they have accidents and so on, you know, because people don't pay any attention to them. Now you see, it's, it, we want to blame them and say, well, I'm, they're not motivated. They don't care. Well, that's wrong. It doesn't solve the problem when you say that. See, what I want you to begin to think is, how, how are we operating? What kind of environment will we create to cause people to think we don't care? Or to think it's okay to do sloppy work? Or it's okay to leave something half done when you go home and then 10 minutes later you could have fixed it? And we could have made a customer happy. So we could live it ahead of time. I mean, all of those kinds of things that occur are occurring naturally. So the best way to respond to that is to turn inward and say, okay, what, what have we created here that causes people to think that's okay? How have we designed the environment? We've got these rules, we come with a rule, and we don't follow it. And to say, anybody that we catch doing this is going to be fired. And it turns out that the best performer you've got does it. Right? And then what you say is, I'm telling you, next time, you'll be fired. The U.S. government is crazy about that. The government is crazy about this. They say stuff that they never do. And then they wonder why people don't follow the law. Because the environment tells them it's okay. Now they would, they would not want to characterize it that way. I don't say it's okay. We never say it's okay. But if you look at the consequences, and we have a tool, if you, if you learn more about this, it's called a picnic analysis, where we can figure out why do people, why do people, whenever somebody says, why do you do that? Then we take them through a picnic analysis and say, look, let's see if we can't look at the consequences they experience in our environment and see why they do that. And most often when they do that, it's like this. Oh, gee, now I see. That our environment really is, is designed to produce that kind of behavior. Now, we wouldn't think of it that way, but I want you to begin to think that way. There was a manager we had for a company uh, in, in uh, America called uh, Dollar General. And Dollar General started as a lot of some farmers put together to buy by volume so they could have cheaper uh, fertilizer and stuff. And it's been very successful now. I think about, about 1,800 stores. But we worked in the distribution centers. And uh, the manager in Zane, Ohio, was 
one of the best managers I've ever worked with. Because they had $7 an hour employee. Paying basically for $7 an hour. They uh, had routine work because it was the distribution center. They had uh, all these uh, conveyor belts that had packages on and so on. And uh, they were pulling stuff and putting them on the, the conveyor belt and loading it on a truck and doing thousands of these a day. Thousands of them a day. And in order to get a job at uh, Zanesville, Ohio, you had to know somebody. You know, so for friends, they got most of their employees from friends recommending them to come. And one of the reasons for that was that the, the, the plant manager, whenever they would lose somebody, either they quit to get another job or they fired them, which was rare. He'd get his team together and he'd ask the question, how did we fail that person? Now, the first line of questioning was about us. How did we do this? Did we hire the right, did, did, did we follow our hiring procedures? When, we, when, they, when they came to work, you know, how did we deal with them in training? Did we put them on the line before they really showed us that they could do the job? Did, uh, uh, when they worked, when they noticed we had a problem with performance on the line, how did we respond to that? And of course, most of the time they found the problem was ours, not theirs. And so they created an environment where people wanted to be. And see, that's where we have positive, positive reinforcement, is people want to be here. We don't have to make them come. We don't have to think about how we can penalize them if they don't, or how we can make them perform to some standard or what. They do that because they want to, because we design the environment to produce positive consequences when they do. Now, you see, most people think about positive consequences as something you put in your pocket. We call it tangible reinforcement. You know, and most people think about money and this kind of thing. Don't think that way. The most frequent consequences are not anything that you could put in your mouth or, or your pocketbook. The most effective consequences are interpersonal. And it may be, it may be a smile. I like a smile. It may be a smile, it could be a thumbs up, it could be, you know, a lot of things. It cost you nothing. You know, it's like, I, I, I know things are changing and I'm old, you know, and I've been around a long time. But I've known supervisors who would, by self permission tell me, I never, I have never, ever told somebody I appreciated the job. They've been there for 20 years. They've never told anybody they do them a job. Now, I'm going I'm to I'm give you a sexist statement, then I'm going to stop in four minutes, that four minutes. You took up a lot of time, you know, talking about I'm sorry. Uh, that women are naturally better at this than men. And that's not sex state to sex, it's just a fact. And I think it's because women are trained, not for this end, but just the natural part of the way little girls are taught, they're taught to notice things that men don't notice. You know, I have, my wife has taught me over the years that, you know, I, I don't notice things. And, I blame it on Hunter Gatherer or some kind of philosophy like that, you know, that I'm going to go out and kill something and bring it into the family to eat for a month. Or month. And you take care of the thing at home, right? And you, you notice the fleas and you pick the fleas in the cave, you know, whatever they did. But they, the women look at the fall thing. And see, the most effective way to change behavior, this concept right here, shaping behavior, Shaping is the positive reinforcement of successive approximations to the goal. And those of you who can see the smallest improvement and reinforce it will get the fastest change. I wrote a book called Oops, and the subtitle is 13 Men Who Practices to Waste Time and Money. And I went on to say, and what to do instead. 
And stretch goals is number two. It's not number two, but it just happens to be number two in the book. And I mean, the people in the New Compassion just wanted to argue with me about that. I mean, I, and I knew they were, I knew they were fighting. Because they just have this culture that you always set a stretch goal. Well, the data shows that stretch goals work less than 10% of the time. But somehow we have this belief that if we set a goal here, then we know that we know that I'm going to set it where the max is. So we want to say, well, let's set a stretch goal, and they set one up here. Well, it's like the goal is going to pull performance out of you. It's going to make you do something you wouldn't otherwise do if we're not there. Well, if that's the case, that's negative reinforcement. So what happens is the most effective way to set a goal is to set the smallest goal. Those of you who can see the smallest change and reinforce it will get the fastest improvement. Because remember, positive reinforcement accelerates the rate of responding. So what that means is if you're in trouble, then you've got to figure out a way, how can we do this more often? How do we reinforce it more often? He said, well, can you do it too much? I said, you probably can, but don't worry about it. You're not even going to go. You won't come up. I'm 80, and I, I play it off as often as I can, which is not enough. And I can tell you, my the fellows I've been playing with for many years now, Never, ever fail to positively reinforce a good job. Sometimes they'll even reinforce a bad job, but they're going to say something about it. You know, I got a friend, and he's bigger around and he is tall. His name's Gene, and Gene has what we call the ability to hit a double cheeker. And I'm not talking about these cheeks. And so when he hits one, he hits it a long way. And we call it a double cheeker. Boy, Gene, that was a double cheeker. Now, it doesn't even have to be in the fairway for us to say something positive about it. Like, man, boy, that would have been great if it had been in the fairway. I mean, way down there. <laughs> it's in the rough. And they'll say, boy, that was a good shot from that lie. That's a tough lie. You hit that really good. Now, you take my friends and put them in the workplace. And it's like God struck them down. <laughs> they cannot say anything positive at work. Now, and I said, well, why is that? They said, well, I don't see anything. <laughs> you know? We worked a lot, a lot of places where most of the supervisors are female, and I tell you, it, I mean, they're baking cakes, they're bringing stuff in, they're buying stuff, they're recognizing you know, all kinds of behavior and so on, and men are just kind of standing there with their hands in the pocket. That's a fact. And I said, for the men, what I say is you have to work hard at something that many women do naturally. Now, let me just say one final thing because they, they're looking at me hard. <laughs> Let's see if we can change this behavior. <laughs> <laughs> that in the United States, I don't know whether it's a prevalent here or not, but in the United States, there is this. Um, child rearing method now that parents have uh, come to that you all you ought to positive reinforce your child. What they mean is you always say something positive, you never say anything negative. Did you, did you have American Idol over here when it was popular in the show where they had people perform? And they had this Englishman who was uh, who started it, um, Silent Cowell. And he was tough on people. He was really tough on people. Simon Cowell. Yeah. He, he's a very rich man now, but, and he made a lot of it on American Idol. But they have these contestants, you know, they have a poet, oh, my daughter's an actress, and they call it Cattle Call. So they send out, we want people, you know, we <laughs> want to sing on them. And so everybody would come, right? And some people were awful. And Simon Cowell was probably the first person in their lives to tell them the truth. I remember one night he said to this young girl, he said, look, don't sing anymore. He said, and I mean don't sing anymore. Don't even sing in the shower. 
<laughs> and the girl started crying. And she said, but people at church love my singing. Yeah. Like, you know, people think, well, it's folks, they're so positive. Her thing was awful, and went, she's awful, isn't she? And they'd say, you know, oh, yeah, I love you, oh, she's awful, isn't she? But the point is, she heard, they love my singing. And why don't you like it? And so, parent, young parents now are creating children that are going to have a, sh a sharp reality check when they get older, right? Everybody ain't like your mama. Everybody will love everything you do. <coughs> Even in sports, you don't have a loser, right? Everybody wins. My, uh, we played uh, soccer. Okay. And my grandchildren. <laughs> all oh, wait. I have to change your name. This is it. 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 But see, they, they respond really responding very well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this, maybe some sucker <laughs> My friend, uh, her grandson was playing soccer, and uh, they don't keep score. No. Because if you keep score, I think somebody would lose. Right? <laughs> and so she was late to practice to the game one day, and when her grandson saw her, he's playing on the field, and he came running over the sideline, said, Grandma, says, we lead in 72, but we're not supposed to know it. Mm. I'm like, I'm fully, fully here. Now, I'm going to stop, because uh, maybe you'll have some questions, but, but I think the point I want to get across in the time we've got, I hope I've got some of it across, is that this is important, this is an important science tonight. For your own general happiness and well-being, as well as what it can do for you, you know, the primary reason I, what I've done is help companies solve problems they've been struggling with for years. And many companies, like they, they, you know, like a fast food restaurant or something, they think that turnover is inevitable. That we, we're, gonna, we're employing high school students and they're going to go off and they're going to go away. And so we build into our uh, business model a figure to account for that. We're going to, we're going to have such a turnover, so let's, that's going to cost us so much, so we have to add that to the price of the product. So, it's not true. What that assumes is we're going to keep the same business model we've got. We're going to treat people like, like uh, they don't want to be here, and they leave, naturally. And so we think, well, that's just the cost, that's just the way this business is. We've never found that. So, I believe, and I think we've got lots of data. We, we have a magazine we call Fox Magazine, we, we quit publishing several years ago. But we have, uh, we're talking about, I think we've got uh, 80, 80 issues of case studies that people did, you know, applying this to the widest range of business problems you can imagine. If you want to be more innovative, it's about the way you treat people. And I don't mean, we want to treat people well. Just because we want to treat people well, we want to treat people well in the context of doing what we do. But those people that help us the most are the ones we want to make the most of, right? And if you're not doing what we want to do, then we're going to figure out how to help you do that. So you can get it. You want that kind of treatment? Then here's the way you get it. But you're not going to get it the way you're performing. Does everybody understand that one? It's very important. And the way business operates today is that we want, we want to do things the easy way. What you think is the easy way, we're going to pay people the same, we're going to give people the same benefits and so on. That's a very expensive way to run a business. Because it doesn't produce the kind of results out the end that you can simply be paid. I'm going to defy the laws of behavior now and stop. <laughs> give only a world of applause.
scientific behavior analysis. And uh, Aubrey managed it to explain to us uh, it in one and a half hours. But there's much more to tell, there's much more to experience, and much more to explore. So if you'd like to uh, want to know more about this, um, I invite you to go uh, to the restaurant, to the, uh, to the bar, have a drink. Then we have a, a few books there. You can uh, look into the books. Um, and I suggest also that you are all uh, are around there so that you can ask, uh, or that you can, um, if you have some questions, then ask them and we can explain uh, those questions. And uh, for the last, we have a small present, or we, uh, Mir Business wants to give you a oh, present. Yes. Oh, wow. A diamond ring, oh my god! <laughs> Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I will wrap this in Dutch. I will wrap it up in Dutch. Thank you. Um, thank you for your aandacht. Ademloos zit te luisteren, heb ik in ieder geval eens mee in de rol gevallen. Er zullen altijd nog heel veel vragen in jullie leven. Nogmaals, ga mee naar de park en stel je vragen. En wij zijn er ook aanwezig. Als je nu naar huis wil gaan, dat kan natuurlijk uiteraard ook. Als ze naar de bar toe gaan, daar wordt in ieder geval een drankje jullie aangeboden. Neem je voor de volledigheid neem je een jas even mee die als je in de garderobe hebt hangen. Want we komen hier verder uh, niet meer terug. Um, Dank je wel voor je aanwezigheid. Uh, wij zullen jullie voorgaan naar de, uh, naar de zaal toe, naar de, naar de bar toe. En uh, hopelijk tot snel ziens. Ciao.